It's the 12th day of November 2012. We got to celebrate Veterans Day two days in a row, David Patrick. How are you? Very good, thank you. We're in a very familiar place at a very familiar table. A little bit different from the Last Supper, and there are only three of us here. Right. But here we are on a very windy but warm day. Uh, for 60 a, degrees, I think. 60 degrees, working in the yard all morning. It felt really, really good. Before we begin a wonderful program on another calendar that he's done, just want to show a couple of things because Celine is kind enough to let us go in her Champlain History Museum here. And this is something that my wonderful wife, and I call her my long-suffering wife, and she hates it when I say that, she just set this next to my computer the other day. And it's a souvenir, memorabilia, if you will, that's 100 years old. <clears throat> from the dedication of another Champlain monument. Of course, we're very proud of the one right here in Champlain, David. But uh, this is the one in Plattsburgh that was dedicated in the summer of, of 1912. And I had no idea what it was until I pulled that sharp top off and <laughs> learned that it was a salt shaker. I guess it was a salt shaker. I took a whiff of it and I sneezed for an hour and a half. Or pepper. So it could be pepper. <laughs> And then in another drawer, not even realizing I had that one, I found a letter opener and a page marker for the same thing. Obviously, souvenirs that were done at that time. So I'm going to ask yeah. Celine at some time, our dear friend Celine Paulquette, if she has these in her collection here. Well, of, course, of course, you know, those. we can date those to 1912. Uh, the architect of those monuments were, was Hugh McClellan and his uh, two partners. And Hugh McClellan, uh, who's the uh, brother of my great grandfather, um, he's the one. A connection. He's the one who, uh, the architect who built the second story on this, uh, on this uh, bank building. On this building, and yeah. we've seen and, where and, we're sitting right now. And he also did the renovations in 1909 of the Knights of Columbus Hall, which was the session house uh, that's next door. And of course, he was the uh, ar the architect in college who uh, um, who uh, uh, measured out the house across the street, the Clark Funeral Home, and had that rebuilt uh, when it burned down 19, 1912. Oh, too. at the same time, yeah. the Plenty Moore House. Yeah, the Plenty Moore House. Yeah, isn't that among amazing? many other things? Uh, you know, the St. John's Episcopal Church, Bunt Myers Building, and Rouses Point. The two elementary schools, uh, you know, here in Champlain, he Rouse had his Point, fingers of all uh, of that and more. the old Presbyterian Church, which yeah. was the Village Hall, uh, burned down 1927. So a lot of different things that he, you know, has his fingerprints on. Yeah, I mean, I, we should e spend even more than a minute talking about this marvelous building and what Celine has done for well, it, isn't it? It's it's a don't amazing. you just love it? Yeah. I remember seeing it maybe ten years ago, and there was. You know, you, the, the plaster and was torn out and everything, and it was in rough shape. That's like the, that Trudeau house up in Saranac Lake that Calvin and I went to when we did a program on, on Trudeau's background. But this, if you look at the old photographs, and this was kind of a lower flat building, wasn't it, back in the, back in the day? This building, uh, the second story, was added in 1905. Yeah. And so we can date many, many photographs of the village of Champlain by just looking at this bank uh, building. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, boy, when you talk about hot off the presses, I could almost smell the ink when I walked in the building. Yeah. You, did is, you pick these up on the way over here today yeah, or what? This, these were printed last week and finished up Saturday, I believe. And uh, I just picked them up just about an hour before. Our viewers, if they're new viewers to our little corner and hometown cable, they don't know this. But if they're regular viewers for a long time, they know that you've been doing this. Yeah. Since you were a young guy, how many, 11? This is my 11th uh, 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 calendar. So I started in 2003, and it's just grown and grown uh, in terms of the project, where before I had only three pages of filler uh, for an essay, and then I went to uh, five pages, and se or seven pages, and 11, and I've been doing quite often a 15-page uh, essay in the back, so not only do I have 13 good you know, big pictures of, of scenes around the town of Champlain. I also write an essay, and uh, which always has a theme, you know, to it. Um, and, you know, this theme 
for this year is the establishment of the early roads and bridges in the, in the town of Champlain. And uh, so I went into a lot of detail as to what bridges existed from 1794 up to the present day and found out that there was a lot of bridges and of course uh, Champlain hasn't been immune to uh, ice jams and it's been pretty notorious for that and uh, um, you know there a lot of bridges have come and gone so I, I figured that out yeah, especially in the 1800s. You and I started talking about it before even before Calvin got here to set up the hometown cable camera today um, you know, you're a humble guy, but I want our viewers to know that this is even more, to say it's a labor of love is a gross understatement. And that's not, it was hard enough for you to do the first year, yeah. but the second year and the tenth year, and I had no idea that you were even doing another one until Calvin sent me a little yeah. email saying, hey, it's just about time. Yeah. So, yes. You're dedicated to this. You. And tell people why you're so interested in the history of this area. Well, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, um, my ancestors, you know, lived up here. Um, I'm related to Pliny Moore, who lived just across the street and came here in 1785 and, and surveyed the, uh, you know, what was called the Morrisville Grant, uh, which he had got from the state of New York uh, for serving in the Revolutionary War. And, uh, you know, he came up here and I got, a, you know, several hundred relatives who are, uh, you know, deceased in the, in the cemeteries here. But, uh, um, you know, and later on, Hugh McClellan worked uh, in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, and 40s. He was a um, relative, of course, of Pliny Moore and the Nye family. And he worked to um, collect papers and, and uh, you know, memorabilia, photographs, etc. And and he continued that for many many years. Then he worked on the cemetery inscriptions, uh, which is known as the McClellan and McClellan Cemetery Collection, um, uh, which is in in Clinton County, uh, Quebec, and also in uh, Franklin County in, in Vermont. So he had a lot of interest in all this, and he, he was born in 1870s, uh, Hugh McClellan. So obviously he lived a long time ago. Uh, up until the 1960s, and uh, it's a project I started off, you know, in around 1995 as a genealogy project to just figure out who I was related to and the particulars, and uh, you know, then that migrated in 2003 from a genealogy project to a history project because so many things overlap. Plenty more I'm related to, but he also was first judge, first postmaster, you know, the person who the British Ar American armies used as their uh, um, headquarters, you know, the house, so he was always in the know. And uh, so it's really good that we're able to look at, you know, what he wrote and, and continue and get that information out there. So I've always said over and over um, in these, like, in these little uh, meetings here that I like to connect the dots. And there's That's a lot of dots. That's my favorite phrase yeah. in the world. There's a lot of there dots out so there. There are so many dots, yeah. aren't there? Yeah. There's so many dots, so much pieces of information, you know, newspaper clippings and memorabilia people have and, and a photograph. Um, and it's all out there. A lot of it was collected by the McClellans and then it's been dispersed. But, uh, um, you know, a lot of stuff is here too. Celine is been able to capture some of the stuff back from all over the country here at a history center. So I'm taking, I like to take this information and uh, digest it and, and use it, you know, in these calendars and, you know, whether it has, you know, I find a lot of information about people um, that lived here and, and industry, um, the photographs, uh, the stuff about Burt Payne, which he was the photographer who took a lot of these photographs here. Um, so there's a lot of information out there and I'm, I always, I, I try to put it together. One would think that by this time in November of 2012, there would be no more historical stones to, o to turn over and no more dots. And every time I look at the product of your tremendous invention, I say, there's got to be more stones. You've yeah. got to discover stuff every year. Problem is, unfortunately, people learn stuff, 
they have it. If they don't write it down, they die, and then it's lost forever. And then someone else has to take, Boy, you know, to re, has to has to rediscover it. I mean, you know, a lot of times I make all these great discoveries, but the problem is, someone else knew it probably 50 years ago, and I, I just figured it out, you know, yesterday. Perfect example: Pike's Cantonment. Everybody knew where it was by the turn of the exactly. 20th century, yeah. and 50 years later, nobody knew where it was. And exactly. look at the battle it was to locate it, and now we know. Yep. And we're doing archaeology, and that's great. So you're right. Those stones have been turned over and flopped back People down. People knew. If you yeah. don't write it down, and it doesn't get disseminated out there, and if it's just one, even if you wrote it down and it's one place, and it's in someone's uh, uh, you know, family material in a basement, then that gets thrown out, you know, a hundred years later, and it's of no use. And a lot of this material here has been preserved, is and you know we're able to read it. And then there's all this other material out there in the, you know, around the country. A lot of these, um, a lot of these pictures were sometimes postcards. So that you oh, may yeah. find those on eBay, um, these particular photographs, but in pretty rough shape. So. Uh, um, so there's a lot of information out there, and it's just basically rediscovering and connecting the dots. Again. Each one of these uh, 11 calendars is a history book. It's bona fide history. You know, when you do, a, when you do any kind of a compendium like this, you, you have a focus, and each year you have a, I don't know how you come up with a new one. I don't know how you came up with the roads and bridges this yeah, time. Yeah, every year I, I think about it. Um, some years I definitely have a, a focus on, for example, uh, work, working on the cemetery, you know, on the cemeteries uh, last year in 2012 calendar, I wanted to do that for a few years. And, you know, I've written twice about the War of 1812 in, in Champlain. Um, one was a general one, then I went into more details about Dewey's Tavern, um, because I do, uh, I do uh, part of the celebration at Dewey's Tavern sure. in September. And uh, so every year has a theme, and you know every year I think about it, um, and, and write down little notes for myself saying, could I work on this topic or this topic or this topic, and then starting around July I need to start, you know, cementing it down. So uh, um, that's when I start to look at what I have, and is it going to be easy or hard? And you know I thought the bridges in town would be. The roads and bridges would be fairly easy because I had some information, but it turned out it was actually one of the harder ones because the information <laughs> was spread out. You're not going to make anything too yeah, easy for it, yourself. It was spread baby. out you know, in so many different locations. Uh, you know, information, you know, not under a folder that called bridges. It was under a folder, you know, where, of a person's name who was highway commissioner in 1840. So there you go. Um, not easily found. Let's talk a little bit of just about the structure of, uh, of make, making the calendar. Why, why a calendar, first of all? Why, why, well, why is it necessary? Um, I, you know, back in 2003, I wanted to come out with a, like a history, a booklet of photographs mm -hmm. uh, based on something that I'd worked on before of just compiling photographs. And I realized that the calendar could give me the ability to write like a, make an 8 by 10 photograph. I, I'm not really interested in photographs that are maybe this wide. Yeah. Uh, I want something big, something large, you know, that you see like in a National Geographic magazine or mm -hmm. something like that. So, and I wanted to write a caption. So I realized, well, if I do a calendar, um, then, and the calendar is more of a, just a way of expressing that, you know, to mm -hmm. the large photographs. And so the calendar gives me 13 large format photographs. And, you know, and, I can work with that, and you know I work with the photographs, and coming up uh, with particular photographs that I think would work for uh, the calendar. Um, the essay actually was more of a secondary thing. It was, my primary thought originally was just to do the calendar with the 13 images, and then like I said, I had three pages the first year. <laughs> you know I think it was seven by adding an extra sheet, yeah. and then 11, and then 15 because I realized I liked writing more, you know, about a subject and getting that extra information out there than, you know, just writing, you know, putting, you know, pictures in. Because I could write a very, I could write a description for a photograph, 
that's maybe you know three sentences long or a paragraph this big and uh, I'd prefer something that's of more course. descriptive because it doesn't really you help were, you. You were never a man of a few words right, anyway. Right, but uh, it wouldn't really be helpful if I said this is Main Street 1905 sure. period. You know, what, do you, yeah. what about Main Street? What about you know, Main Street in 1797, yeah. that, that information's out there, you know, you'd have to dig for it, but you could probably always find something that, you know, that's not real readily known and then put it into that picture because it's Main Street. So the calendar's 15 bucks, it's printed by? Uh, Border Press and Rouses Point, who does a really good job. Our, our good friends for so long, yep. uh, for such a long time. Just got these printed up within the last few days. Yep. And uh, what goes? What happens to the money? Uh, the money goes to uh, the Glenwood Cemetery here in Champlain, uh, just for regular, you know, upkeep of the cemetery. And where can people find um, these calendars? Are going to be at the us usual spots: Town and Village Office here in Champlain, uh, Kinney Drugs in Champlain. Um, the Chauvin Insurance Agency here at the History Center, uh, the uh, Cornerstone Gift in Rouses Point, uh, Cornerstone Bookstore in Plattsburgh, also at CCHA in Plattsburgh. How many will you put? In, this in Conroy's. Time? In Conroy's. Uh, uh, about 250 or so. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Have you have you managed to sell most of them every year? Yeah, you know, you sell about 150, 200. So it's, considering that's a, uh, um, you know, there's only yeah, maybe what two thousand families in town or so in Champlain. Well, hopefully this program with Calvin and Hometown Cable every year helps because we think it's important. We yeah. think you've done something that is important. I personally feel as though every grade school in the North Country should have ten or twenty or thirty copies of this. I think yeah. there should be a. I think it should be a part of the curriculum, especially in the northern tier yeah there's a lot of information in these calendars and uh you know that you aren't going to find in too many anywhere spots, yeah. anywhere yeah yeah so you have to be pleased yep. that it turned out this well we're as we what we normally do is go through and you have to, and you have to make a lot of choices when you get these photographs yeah. first of all the one for the front yeah well um when i realized i when i came upon the theme of the bridges and roads then I figured that I had to find photographs that I hadn't used um, or, you know, that were maybe used, you know, as a smaller inset uh, in previous calendars that had a bridge or a road in it that would fit with the theme. So I actually spent a lot more time than I would normally do looking through, you know, pictures and, and trying to come up with that. Of course, you know, the cover one is important and I had maybe two or three pictures that I had to think about but this is you know it's a picture of Perry's Mills the bridge it's a great photograph and uh, so I decided to use that as the uh, as my cover photograph what what year would this date so a lot of these pictures these big ones here were um, probably dating from about 1909 1910 um, and uh, they were uh, you know taken in Perry's Mills and Coopersville Champlain um, and around town, um, but it's a, it's a great photograph. But so anyway, a lot of these photographs, um, I had to go back and uh, you know decide which ones that I wanted again. You know that had the bridges and the road scenes on it. Oh. So then I have to figure out what what month to put it in, and uh, oh. you know try to make sure that I have uh, pictures from each you know hamlet here in the town of Champlain. Obviously, you want a winter scene yep. in on January, so we open the front cover. I love that picture. Yeah, and this is a busy little picture right there. Tell us about it. This picture here is a great photograph. It actually shows the building that we're in right now, on the left, the bank building. And again, we we can date this picture here because it doesn't have the second story that we're we're sitting in, and so it was built before. Uh, Fortunately, the photograph was uh, dated December 25th, 1901, but we know the second story was built in 1905. And it's a great photograph because it's January and it's winter photograph, and it shows the bridge that was, I don't know exactly when it was built because so many bridges 
even iron bridges stood there um, from uh, at this location. This location here was called the Lower Bridge. Oh. Um, if you ever see the Lower Bridge mentioned, that's uh, the Elm Street Bridge. The Upper Bridge is on Main Street where Church Street is and that we'll be saying that quite often but in the back background is the the original Pliny Moore house Clark funeral home uh, to the right was a warehouse that uh, I don't know when it disappeared but uh, I heard it was a bowling alley you know you know by people who oh, really you know recently I, wow and it was, a, it was a gas station it was it was built probably around 1850 um, but it's a, it's a great photograph. Oh, that's. Did you show the bottom part where there's a calorie yet? And you cho you always choose a few small. Yeah, and then uh, on top of that, I I experimented some years ago with putting ins insets and uh, smaller photographs to build upon the the main photograph. And on the right is actually a, br a picture I took just recently um, of the Perry's Mills Bridge today. Um, which is the cover photograph that you that you uh, um, showed earlier? Yeah. What's odd about this picture is it doesn't look like it's the same loca location. No, that's what I said it before. Is. You yeah. can't. You, no you, way you'd know. You would no way you would know. And the only way, what I figured out is when they built the new bridge, the uh, the cement posts, the abutments came out much further than what they did in the older photograph. Oh, so it's actually a smaller span. I see what you mean. Huh? Yeah, Calvin's got to look at that too. Yeah. You got it. I bet you that's the photographer's car. Yeah. And actually, yeah, what's interesting about the cover photograph is, and, and I stood there and I took the photograph, is there's a small island right under the guy's car in the background. That island is still there. If, uh, and you can, you can clearly see an yeah. island in the... Uh, now that you mention it, when yeah. I first looked at it, my old eyes didn't even see the car. Didn't yeah. know what that the, was. That until car I there is probably B.F. Payne's car. Who you know, we've done that before. There's his car on the street, yeah, right? Exactly. He Isn't he, that he was one of the uh, uh, earliest uh, people to more or less an auto dealer in Champlain. And uh, at, when he got out of the business of photography, he went into selling cars. And this is 1909-1910. So he had one of the first cars. He he liked gadgets, and had a uh, it was in last year's calendar. Had a building or a, a little Photoshop, um, literally right here at the base by the Champlain House by the oh, bridge really? on Main yeah. Street, oh. where we sold postcards. Which coincidentally are the postcards that we buy today, you know, off eBay or someplace. Yeah, same ones. Do you have a large collection of postcards? I, I have a small one. Celine has a uh, pretty good collection. Uh, Calvin's got lots. Yeah, of, yeah. Every now and again, he, yep. he he bids on one that he yeah. likes. And what's nice about this photograph, if you look, uh, you know, and in the scan here, there's a little boy in the cover photograph that you can barely see. And uh, you know, I, I zoomed in. Oh, and yeah, you can that's see another him. thing that I would not. Yeah. That's why people take these old photographs and they use a magnifying glass or yep. blow them, blow them up once you digitize them. Yep. Isn't that amazing? So it's uh, you know not crystal clear, but you can still see the boy standing there at the river. Oh, so uh, you know I took a picture of uh, of the scene today, um, and it, like I said, it doesn't look like that now. No. The uh, the bank is actually overgrown today. Yeah. And the river looks a lot less wider than it does in this picture here in the cover photograph. You know we urge uh, we urge people to. Get a copy of this calendar right away. You know it's utilitarian, but I'm sure that anybody who owns one doesn't write in the little squares like we do with some yeah, other photograph. Yeah. Because it's a collector's. It's uh, a collector's piece. They yeah. all are, and I'm sure many people are proud to tell you I have all eleven. I actually eight, have eight. quite a few people who say that, and then I have other people who say they want to collect the whole series. Do you have like 2005 or 2008? So I, there's a lot of people that are actually collecting the series now. Yeah. Do you have a few left over from each year? Yeah, and those can be bought at the village and town offices. No kidding. Oh, or, that's great. Yeah, or here at the history center. So if they have, if you ha want a particular year, um, either contact me or 
uh, go to the town or village office. Library too, I think, here at the Champlain Memorial Library. Yeah, this building is such a great focal point for the community, and Celine has a lot of different events here. I've yeah. been here several times, and I love to come here. I love the people from this this region. Well, that's great. We've only covered one page yeah. so far. Oh, two. That's, what do you, uh, a couple pages, yeah. What do you say we get to February here? Yeah, February. And take a picture of of the river. Talk, talk about it. So anyway, the this is a picture of Champlain taken from the south bank looking north. And to the right, you can see the Presbyterian Church, which is which later became the Village Hall at the corner of Church and Main Street. And then you see what we call the upper bridge. It's a very large bridge. To the left of that is the uh, Champlain Agricultural Works. Um, at, you know, before it was, um, it was at some point around that time probably going out of business, but actually been op in operation for about a hundred years. Um, but making plows maybe what wasn't as lucrative then, and it was say in 1820 or 1840. But it's a great scene that shows a field um, and a very large uh, hill overlooking the uh, the river. And again, that's probably uh, that's south of the village. It's probably a hard location to get to now. Yeah, we should mention the Feinberg Library and Special Collections because yep. it's it's an amazing and wonderful local resource. Yeah, it's a great inf place to find you know a lot of this information here. The uh, this photograph below. Okay. And the inset uh, actually came from uh, the History Center. And when the, they made the iron bridges, the first iron bridge built in Champlain was built 1871 on the Dubois Road Bridge. And uh -huh. then the second bridge built a few years later, 1874, was the bridge here at the Upper Bridge. And uh, unfortunately, that bridge has been swept away a few times. I don't know how many. And so this is not the original bridge. There's always newspaper clippings about the bridges, upper or lower bridges being swept away due to ice, you know, in April. Um, but when these bridges were built, they were built of iron. Iron was actually, an iron bridge was basically half the cost of a wood and stone bridge. And someone did the analysis, it's in, it's in here uh, in this uh, calendar where they were talking about the cost of it being half of, of what it used to cost because it was these bridges were more or less prefabbed in pieces and they could be built pretty pretty fast and unfortunately they were built of iron with wooden planks with, with planks and I, I mean I'm yeah I'm uh, old enough to remember going across many iron bridges with plank, bo plank yeah bottoms. it was wood it was pine planks yeah. and uh, in the inset photograph it shows a person who uh, was probably driving a, a dump truck and the back wheel went right through the uh, I, I see that through the uh, truck uh, they could the only road. hold a hundred pounds per square foot yeah <laughs> I love it well, we're talking to David Patrick about his latest in a series of calendars about the uh, Champlain area, Town of Champlain. And this is the 2013 Town of Champlain Historic Calendar, Establishment of Early Roads and Bridges in Champlain Town. It's a mammoth project every year, and yet he continues to do it. He's a glutton for punishment. And, but the end result has got to be so satisfying. Yeah. As we turn these pages and you say, Oh, I spent about 15 hours on that one alone or whatever. Yeah. What are we looking at here in March? Well, in March, we're looking at the uh, lower bridge. And this picture was taken March 22nd, 1938. It shows one of Champlain's persistent ice jams that um, is seen probably less frequently now, but it was seen quite often in the 1800s and even 1900s now. But uh, uh, this shows the, the newest bridge that was built. Uh, this bridge was built in 1937. It's the one that's still present today. And unlike every other bridge in town, um, you know, we first started off with wooden bridges and then these uh, iron bridges, which were pretty flimsy. And the ice could just carry those bridges away. Finally, people 
you know, got smart and they started designing bridges that were, uh, had huge steel beams and uh, like this bridge here and even though it's low the beam is probably about three or four feet tall and it's a very sturdy beam uh, that's holding up the bridge and that's seen, seen in a different photograph later on in the calendar where they're moving it from Prospect Street to Elm Street it's a huge huge beam but anyway the ice this bridge has been the longest uh, 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 present bridge here in, in, in town and uh, it survived probably 70 something floods and ice jams and it's still well, you it's, think about it it's, it's so it's going definitely going. been tested and basically I would assume that the townspeople here are looking at the ice flow which is actually touching the bottom of the bridge and wondering and of course it's all up up and down Main Street uh, but they're probably wondering is this bridge going to hold and of course it did now in the inset photographs all right let's go down and Oh, you're going to do it from there. Inset photograph, the top <coughs> one, 1905, shows again the, the older iron bridge um, and the, the ice right up to that. That bridge survived that ice, you know, ice jam, but it was obviously a very uh, uh, rickety bridge. Yeah. Uh, the below photograph, again, it's a, probably a different view of the same uh, ice jam, and, uh, the, you know, the ice is touching. 38. Yeah, 38, yeah. yeah. The ice is touching the bottom of it, but it just went right under. That's a, that's truly amazing. And did you did the Champlain Temperance Society really note the alcohol consumption? Well, apparently, uh, <laughs> it, you know, what, I, what I do is uh, for each month I write about a little tidbit of information uh, pertaining for that to that month. If I find something, I, I write it down. You know, it could be a newspaper clipping, and. The Temperance Society in uh, the town of Champlain was very active uh, during this time, um, 1830s, 1840s, 50s, 60s, and uh, you know it, it noted uh, that alcohol consumption was quite significant here in the town, and you know, and it, they said it caused a lot of problems. And of course, you know, they were against drinking alcohol in the first place. So. Fourteen thousand gallons of liquor in one year. Yeah. Half of it being consumed in town, other half in Canada. <laughs> Don't you love it? Oh my goodness! Of course, my time was many years later, yeah. but so you know that's that's what the feelings were in in those days, and uh, I guess it culminated, you know, in the early 1900s with uh, prohibition. Oh, that's why, and that's a whole separate set of stories, yeah. isn't it, huh, yep. David? Yeah, you could probably write, a, you know, do a, obviously a couple stories on that on the border. Oh, oh that's nice. great. Well, when we're talking wintertime and springtime, yeah. you're bound to get those ice jams, and here we are in the so, April of that again, year. Again, I chose this photograph here mainly because of the bridge uh, photograph. It's one of the few pictures I have of the upper bridge, which was the iron bridge on, on uh, Main Street near uh, Church Street and it shows huge you know probably two foot thick uh, chunks of ice floating down Main Street and uh, um, you know people standing you know in the water but it's a great photograph in the zoom the insets I have I was able to zoom in on the same photograph and you can see the the details of the bridge um, that's harder to see in the main photograph and I always like to do the uh, past and present uh, angles photographs so I always try to take a photograph of a particular scene of, to, of what it looks like today so that's that's what it looks like today the bridge uh, again it's a fairly modern bridge I think it was built in 1931 and it's a it's a pretty solid bridge and then you have to choose every single month a little tidbits of information that you want to add yeah. along the way. So if people, we're not going to go through every one of those, but for people who buy this calendar, it's interesting as a family, I think, to sit around and look at the calendar, talk to the kids, and, and reflect on the memories an adult or grandparent or great-grandparent might have. Because there are still lots of people around who remember uh, yeah. 1935, 1938, 1939. Yeah. I know my parents would. And oh, yeah, go yeah ahead. both of those pictures, I also have newspaper clippings. Uh, oh, you from do? March and April, uh, describing uh, 
the um, March and April describing the uh, the bridges that were destroyed. All right, here we we're already up to May. And May it shows the uh, what would be called the the Coopersville bridge, and that's the bridge over Route 9B. That bridge has an interesting uh, history because it was 1816 or 1805 is when uh, Benjamin Moore's the general uh, Rev Revolutionary War. He was actually part of George Washington's uh, bodyguard during the Revolutionary War, and uh, um, years later, you know, settled in Point of Rush and uh, uh, owned quite a bit of land in, in Moore's uh, and, and in Champlain and Plattsburgh and Cumberland Head. But anyway, in 1805, he bought a bunch of plots of land that was in last year's calendar. Um, and built some mills on the Corbo River or Creek, which is uh, very, very good for mills. There was probably about a dozen mills on Corbo Creek by the 1850s. Ah. And um, the it's a small creek, but it's it's has a good source of water. So he built some mills there. There was no bridge where Route 9B is, and he wrote a letter to uh, the state legislature or his representative asking that the, st the state fund a bridge at his location because of the, uh, the fact that people would have to um, travel 10 miles out of their way to take the bridge right here in front of this building, the Elm Street Bridge, to get around to the other side. And uh, so he petitioned the, the state for that. And it was at this area, the Coopersville was called Moore's Mills for a, a brief time. And uh, when Moore's owned the property, and then 1817, uh, Ebenezer Cooper bought out Moore's Mills and, uh, you know, land, and uh, it became known as Coopersville. Good stuff. Let's look at the bottom part now. Are you going to show The bottom that? shows the uh, different different scenes of the same bridge. Uh, it was a couple other photographs that I had and it was a zoom of a little boy standing there um, at the uh, uh, at, at the base of the bridge and you can see a few photographs of that. Then there's another view of the photograph. So what's interesting is, you know, we'll mention it in the essay, but after this bridge was built, 1820s, we, I suspect, it was destroyed in 1835 then uh, Noah Dye Moore, my relative ancestor, asked that a drawbridge be built. Oh yeah. Uh, because by this time the canal boats were uh, being built just upriver near the uh, village of Champlain, and the drawbridge was built around 1838. It was uh, destroyed in 1857, the Great Flood. And another big flood. And uh, you know, then I think it was also destroyed in 1887 in the, in the ice jam. So this bridge was, um, I wrote, this bridge was rebuilt and is shown here in July 1908. So it was probably one of the last bridges, um, iron bridges built at this location. We're so fortunate that we have uh, a lot of photographs. Uh, and many of them are available in special collections. Yeah. Some of David's collection. Yeah, and at, at, this lane, at the History Center here. History right? Center here, where we're on yeah. the second floor. And Clinton County Historical Association, too. Yeah. Um, has, uh, you know, other photographs of the same, of this area. It's many different collections. We spend a lot of time trying to get people passionate about history. Most people don't have the time or the inclination to be as passionate as you are, yeah. David, but we're grateful for you because... Uh, this is such a big kick for me every year yeah. to see these calendars, and I hope many of our viewers will will get five or ten even before Christmas time if this is shown before Christmas. Yeah. What a nice little gift, and you're helping the community. Too. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah. It, people, it makes a great gift. People uh, buy these. Uh, uh, the majority of the people buy these right before Christmas, so I know they're used used for gifts and okay, stuff. Okay, let's shoot for 500 this year. Yeah. You're gonna have to print some more. Yeah, we'll call Mr. Rochester. And I can print them. Busy yep. up there. All right, we're up to June, my birthday month. Yeah, mine too. So, uh, oh, really, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, Another Gemini. Yeah. No wonder there are four of us sitting here instead of two. Okay. You and I are twins. Oh, okay. We each we're each twins, the Gemini twins. But you're not left-handed, are you? No. No, I am. 
Okay, go ahead. Uh, so anyway, uh, this shows the lower bridge, the bridge literally just about five feet outside of this bank building. And it's a great photograph. Uh, uh, the Clinton County Historical Association had this photograph. And it's probably one of the earliest photographs I've seen of, of Champlain. Uh, in this photograph here, you do not see the bank building. The bank building was built 1880, okay? The bottom half. Uh, yeah. It's gone. It's not there. What you have, what you see is the wooden uh, frame house that is sometimes seen between the bank building and the Knights of Columbus Hall. And that was taken down in 1910. Uh, that was owned by a person named Forbes, and I think it was a like a furniture dealer. Yeah. And then... Um, and then behind that, and you can barely see it in this photograph, is the Knights of Columbus Hall, which was the session house yeah. um, at that time. But it was more a rental in 1870. So I'm, I'm dating this picture here to about 1870 or so, 1871. Wow. And it shows a, a wooden bridge, uh, very interesting. And I used it actually in another, photo, in another calendar some years ago. But it's a great photograph. Um, and uh, it shows a wooden, a wooden bridge that's divided in two halves, and then there's Isn't a walkway. Isn't that unique and interesting? Yeah, and it's actually, I figured out, it was probably the bridge built in 1858. Uh, in 1857, October, there was a huge flood um, in Champlain, and the water apparently rose five feet higher than it had ever uh, you know, risen before, even with ice jams, wiped out every dam, every bridge, you know, the railroad bridges, everything in, in, in all of town. And so they built all these bridges in 1858, and they were still wooden at the time, being that the iron bridges were built 1871 and after. But anyway, on the side view, the inset shows, I realized that showed, it was another photograph I had, it showed the same bridge uh, from a different angle. And you can see it's the same bridge because it has uh, the the two pathways, yeah. you know, the division, um, and it's a it's a wooden bridge and it's held by a uh, uh, stone pier in the middle of the Chazy River. Now below that shows the uh, the 1937 bridge, the one that's present today, the Bethlehem steel girder that was being moved from by a tractor from. Prospect Street to uh, um, Elm Street, and I would assume it was probably taken off a boat in Lake Champlain and probably taken down Prospect Street and Chapman Street. And then the bank building, uh, bottom picture shows the bank building, the road says a detour sign, July 6, 1937, so I, you know that's when this bridge was built, the one that we see here. Oh, that's great. I love it. All right. Well, we're at summertime. Yeah, this uh, picture here is uh, it's more of a general photograph. I don't really know who the people are, except that it was probably taken in Champlain someplace. And it shows people uh, celebrating July 4th. Um, and, uh, um, you know, with a, basically, a, you know, either a supper or a picnic. I but bet I, there's somebody... Somebody, somebody's got grandparents, well, great grandparents. You can, you can surely say that people are here today that have relatives in that picture. And, oh, sure. You know, and I've, I have, I've had people in the past tell me that they've found their relatives in, in certain scenes. I you know, love it. I think that's, that's one of the great yeah. virtues of the programs that we do on a regular yeah. basis. People say, yeah, but you've got a picture of my grandmother's house. Yeah. And then the sm smaller inset photographs uh, were from the July 4th, 1907 parade where the Samuel D. Champlain uh, monument was dedicated at St. Mary's Church. There was a huge parade, and we've talked about this before a um, couple times, 2009 calendar, but um, there was a parade from Oak Street down to the church, and that's what the photographs show. Their photographs are small enough not to be used for the bigger, you know, pictures. So I put them off for the insets. I like. Looks like they had a good feed that day on the Fourth yeah, of there July. Yeah, huh? at that time there was ten thousand people who came to Champlain to see the dedication of the uh, of the monument. And of they came, course. And they came on the train from Plattsburgh and from all over the area. And that's two years before the Champlain monument was yeah, dedicated. Yeah. Well, in no, that was more, that was 
two years before 1909, yeah. and then uh, five years before oh, yeah. uh, the 1912 uh, uh, monument. It. Yep. I'll guarantee you a lot of those visitors are from Quebec. Of course yeah. they were. For good reason, sure. Yep. Always. Society, yeah, and they were oh, actually, yeah. that was in the parade. There were the, you know, one of the participants in the parade that you've seen other photographs of. Oh, yes. Well, you know, the border, the border didn't separate as much as some people might think it does today. Back yeah. then, that's for sure. All right. This picture here August. Uh, is August. It shows Perry's Mills. That's what the photograph's labeled. So I don't believe it's the uh, Chazy River. It was probably maybe Beaver Creek or a particular, you know, small creek here in Perry's Mills. And it shows really a small bridge, uh, walking bridge, um, over the creek. I believe that's probably B.F. Payne, uh, Bird F. Payne, uh, and he probably took the photograph July 30th, 1909, because I had found a newspaper clipping saying that he was uh, in town taking photographs in Perry's Mills. And the bottom picture, the insets, um, show a couple things. One is the Dubois Road Bridge that's present today, and it shows the 1869 bridge uh, when it was present in 1869 and uh, that it was a wooden bridge and there was many versions of the wooden bridge uh, built uh, prior to the iron bridges. The Du Bois Road Bridge was the first iron bridge built in town was built here at the Du Bois Road um, Bridge and, and I think that that's been destroyed a few times. The other picture of the person is uh, Bird F. Payne. You know, it's a nice portrait of him. Yeah, I don't remember seeing you. Did you put a picture of him? Yeah, in last year's. I couldn't yeah, remember. A different I said, picture. I remember the cars and that all thinking, now well, that's yeah. his car. That's yeah. his car because he became a dealer. Yep. And, uh, you know, then there's also an inset showing the, uh, you know, highway commissioners. Um, there was every year or every couple of years, highway commissioners were uh, elected by the uh, townspeople, and they were responsible for built, you know, the roads and bridges and and surveys uh, and et cetera in town. So, you know, a lot of times they had to uh, post uh, notices at the say the uh, the brick schoolhouse, which was the brick schoolhouse was uh, on uh, Church Street across from St. Mary's. It's that building that was torn down last year. It wasn't that building, but it was that location where it was the older church or the older school. But they all often had to put up public notices if there was going to be a change in the highway, in the road. And, and here it describes the change in the highway going out to Perry's Mills. Uh, 1840, Hiram Hayford was the surveyor, and Joel Savage was the town clerk. We're talking talked often on this program and in various other venues about Murray's raid and Colonel John Murray who came down and burned a couple of black houses down and then he made it to Plattsburgh and I guess he gave them an ultimatum. We'll burn your town or we'll burn the Pike's Cantonment. Oh, okay. So the people saved their town and they, they flattened Pike's Cantonment and that's yeah. one of the reasons it took us so long to, to find it because it was all made of wood. They were all yeah. log homes and so they, they were uh, pyromaniacs back in those days. Yeah, a lot of things that... got burned down in those days. It was yeah. A deal. Okay, September. September shows a very interesting house. I don't know too much history of the house itself. I believe it's still present. It was definitely present today, the house that you see in this photograph. And uh, it also, to the side, you can see probably the most detailed view of the, uh, of the upper bridge. This location here, I mentioned it in the essay, well, I can talk about it here, um, was a kind of a contentious location because back in 1811, Plenty Moore had a, uh, had a mill. Uh, the old stone mill was built right on the other side of the uh, road or on the west bank, right where the main street is today, at the foot of the bridge. And it was thought that a, they wanted to build a permanent bridge and a highway going across the bridge to Perry's Mills. And there's pictures that we'll show later that show 
his stone mill was literally right where the road was and there was only you know 50 feet of separation between the buildings oh. so here the town is proposing to build a highway literally through your backyard um, you know between you know the garage and the house and he was opposed to that and said that he thought the bridge and the highway should be built um, a little bit further north right where the river uh, turns and that's where I think it's Church Street Extension or Mason Street is today. Um, uh, and for what happened was, and he wrote a petition in 1811 to, talking about all the reasons why the highway should not be laid through, you know, his property. And it was, but you can see in the, in the 1849 uh, inset picture I have here that it shows the, the road and the bridge basically scooting between buildings yeah and it wasn't it was a very thin you know very not very wide bridge and I think the road was not really a widely used road because even in 1869 it's a dotted line to the bridge because that the stone mill was still present there aha uh -huh. today the stone mill burned down 1876 there's no indication that there was a mill there there was no indication that there was a ditch where water went under the road, you know, to, to, you know, the flume, you know, to power the sawmill. There's no indication today that there any of this existed. But, you know, it's amazing how things kind of come and go. Um, the inset photographs show the same building, I believe, uh, heavily modified, um, you know, with the windows. Um, in, in this, in the 1911 photograph, as well as uh, 2012. And it's again built literally right next to the uh, the bridge. Yeah, they put a, a porch on it, didn't they? I'm yeah, like, and one of the that? things, you know, a lot of, you know, houses in town today have changed over the years because of the of the porches. Here you have a small porch in front of the uh, house, and then today, you know, that small porch has turned into a fully enclosed large porch, oh, you know, that wow. hides most of the, the house. And you see that happen a lot around a lot of these houses when they get turned into apartments, you know, rentals. Well, that too, yeah, 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 yeah. Great stuff. And once again, we urge people, when you buy your calendar, read everything on it. Yeah. Because it's so it's interesting. A lot, of, a lot of different pieces of information. So much great information that uh, David has bothered to put together here. Oh, we're getting to Sucker Town. Yeah. Sucker Town is, I, I've seen it mentioned many times in the Champlain um, literature and the history of Champlain. And it's actually not in Champlain. It's literally right over the border in the town of Chez But keep in mind, Champlain was, uh, uh, the original town of Champlain uh, went from the border all the way down to Plattsburgh uh, in the early days and all the way to the, almost to the St. Lawrence River. And uh, it was a very large town before it got divided up into, you know, Chazy, Altona, Moors, et cetera, you know, Chazy, I think, in 1804. But um, so anyway, I see a lot of information about Sucker Town. I really wanted to learn about it. And, the, you know, what's great about this photograph, it was taken by Payne, but it also is a photograph of a uh, bridge. So I wanted to learn more about that bridge as well as uh, what Sucker Town was. And apparently, you know, after talking to a few people, everyone had an idea of where it was. It was wrong, um, the, the location. And ultimately, I found the location to be in a spot that more or less doesn't exist today. And it was right off the Stetson Road on Little, uh, uh, Little Chazy River. And... Uh, is a little bit east of the Stetson Road, uh, just over the town line in Chez And what it was, it was named Sucker Town because of the fish that would swim up the river in the early days, and people would spear the fish with uh, um, spears and torches at night. And I've read about that, people doing that in the early 1800s and 1700s in Rouse's Point, and too. And there was still spear fishing well into the 1940s or early 1950s okay. along some of the North Country yeah. rivers. So this is actually pretty far upstream, but the fish would come up here, and then they'd be speared. Um, and uh, so after learning a little bit about it, um, I actually talked to Bob Cheeseman, 
and Shay Z, Shay Z Town Historian, who had uh, some good information on Sucker Town, and he confirmed to me the location of it, and uh, we talked about it, and I, I learned that there was a, uh, it used to be a marble uh, factory on the on the river here, and uh, then it was, uh, you know, looking at the newspaper clippings uh, that I could find online, uh, it turns out this area here was very well known for growing potatoes and all around the farms and they used the potatoes to extract starch and the starches were used for oh, yeah, shirts sure. and stuff oh, like yeah. that and it's supposedly they said if you saw someone walking around with a very stiff collar uh, in those days 1870s they were probably from Suckertown because of the, of the of the starch content you know in isn't the that shirts. amazing people of course today young people have no idea what the starch collars were all about but they were all the rage even when I was a small boy and for many years the celluloid collars and and cuff links and the whole nine yards. I noticed a difference in spelling too. Well, I think the the person who wrote it, you know, maybe he was his assistant or so, because he's done it on other times, uh, was not a good speller. Oh, really? So yeah, sometimes you get letters that are turned backwards, uh, like an S or something or an N. But yeah, that's what he. That's U C C O R T O W. He heard the name. He probably f spelled it phonetically, but. I think it's uh, spelled differently. But sucker has different m meanings, as people who are biblical scholars would know. Sucker means to give somebody support or help, or help, you know, in time yeah. of crisis. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this photograph here is very interesting because it shows an iron bridge with a number of buildings that are present today, or that, that are not present today. Uh, what I found from Bob Cheeseman was. All these buildings over the years have disappeared. What happened was, after this photograph was taken, uh, William Miner uh, built a dam right next to the uh, to the bridge. The dam is still present today, even though it's it's been partially demolished. But in blasting the stone house to the you know on the on the bank there, uh, started to collapse. So he removed the the stone house. Oh. So, and these other buildings have been removed over the years. So, what's interesting is today, you look at all these maps from 1869, 1893, um, all these buildings are present, which, because this photograph was taken about 1909 or so, and then 1939, uh, there's only a, maybe one or so building present, if any. The roads that go to this location are starting to disappear in the 1939 uh, uh, USDA uh, topple map. You see dotted lines. And then if you look at today's map, uh, you know, in 1948, you can see the dam that's present and the, uh, the, road, the bridge that's still present. And if you look at a map, you know, Google map today, there's no roads. All three roads that went to the spot are gone. It's basically field. And this little settlement, uh, very prosperous in 1830 up to the early 1900s, literally disappeared. And the only thing present, and this, what, this is what makes this a great photograph, is that the Iron Bridge still exists. And Bob Cheeseman had photographs of the Iron Bridge. It's the same bridge in the photograph, and it's probably one of the only bridges in this whole area that still exists from 100 years ago. And I think this bridge was probably built 1898. Uh -huh. So, you know, someone could probably, if they're interested in bridges, look at the design of the bridge and, you know, the, you know how they built bridges at that time. It's an unused bridge. It's abandoned. Um, but New York State keeps, still keeps it on its registry. But um, it's, uh, it's still present. And I think it's a great photograph. And I was really happy to find that this one bridge is still in existence. Oh, that's wonderful. All right, let's go to November. November uh, shows the what, what will be Corbo Creek, and it was taken uh, by Payne uh, um, probably in July of 1908, and it shows his car that's present there. Of course, it's got to be his car. Yeah. It's the and, same car we've seen. Yep, yeah. and it basically shows the Lakeshore Road and a very small bridge over the creek. And it's a great photograph. 
Um, and today that bridge does not exist and what exists now is like these two eight foot high uh, eight foot diameter culverts oh yes, that, yes are, I see that go under the water or under the uh, under the under the road and apparently around 2000 or so the uh, this whole area was washed out and that's when they put the uh, these two uh, culverts back in I'm not really sure if there was a bridge there before that or not but you know as, as always happens you know this area gets flooding either from ice or just normal uh, uh, you know uh, you know rainstorms and this little creek here that's trickling now becomes a giant torrent of water and it can you know destroy you know anything in its uh, path we live in a very interesting and sometimes volatile part of the country and uh, many of us who live close to waterways in the north country are have become vigilant over the years and we're fortunate in that uh, for the last several years that hasn't been a serious problem but there are most people I'm sure watching this program remember some very serious floods over the past 50 years in the North Country and yeah, it's and, and what's interesting is sometimes you'll you know if you look at the old newspaper clippings you know 1800s you'll have big floods here in Champlain but not in Plattsburgh. Other times you have yeah. a big flood in Plattsburgh that takes the bridge away in Plattsburgh, but nothing happens up here in Champlain. And you've seen photographs <coughs> in this calendar where the where the ice flows are several feet thick. Yeah. And I can recall it, the Saranac River in Morrisonville with with ice that's four and five feet thick, and yet over the last few years, as we're recording this, it hasn't even frozen over. Yeah, exactly. So we're so, fortunate in that respect. Well, we're, <laughs> We're, we're just glad to be here, I'll tell you that, considering all the things we've been through. We're recording this in the aftermath of uh, this uh, Hurricane Sandy. Sandy, and that's a that's an understatement because it, it was the biggest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, to talk about a hurricane that's uh, a thousand miles wide. Uh, and here we are, while we're watching this and talking about the floods in the past, there are still people in several states who are trying to recover. Oh, yeah. It's going to it, take many, many months. Yeah. So, okay. The last month of the year... December shows the uh, Stone Schoolhouse in Rouse's Point. So, obviously, being that this is a you know calendar for the whole town, I show, you know, uh, Champlain <laughs> Village... Uh, Perry's Mills, Coopersville, and, and you know, one or two photographs from Rouse's Point. And this is uh, a building, uh, this photograph was probably taken around 1960s, uh, late 60s, and it shows really what's called the oldest, is known as the oldest building in, in Rouse's Point. It was the old uh, the Stone Schoolhouse, and it was built probably around 1924 and by Horace M. White, who owned the land. And it was built of, uh, of stone used in Fort Blunder, which was more or less abandoned in 1816. And uh, um, it was used as a, as a schoolhouse for, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And then they built a 1855 a two-story brick house. Uh, schoolhouse was built across the street, uh, a little bit diagonal to Angelo's uh, uh, restaurant today. And you can see that in the uh, the Beers map, 1869. That's an inset photograph. Um, but so after the the school was built, this house basically became a rental property. And uh, um, you know it's a, you know it's a it's a residence today, but it actually has quite a bit of history to this house. And you know there's a lot of photographs to it. To have, the, you ever, have you ever been lucky enough to go inside? No, I've never. Oh, been. wouldn't you love to? I would. Yeah. So to the right of it is actually the Methodist Church, um, and you can see that in one oh, of the inset in the photographs. lower photograph, yeah. Um, yeah that yeah, was yeah, also, yeah. that property was owned by uh, uh, Horace White, and he gave the, the property to the church, and they built a Methodist church there. And, you know, like with so many things today, um, you would ne the church is gone, the schoolhouse is gone, and you would never have known that there was, you know, a, a schoolhouse or a church uh, present at these locations here in Rouse's Point, um, but you know the the photographs are still there, 
and you know the maps still show where the, the locations were. I love it when some of the buildings exist so that you can at, at, at least get yourself a, something to look at when yeah. you're in the area. It's in many places, as you've proved that other people too, it's hard to take a before and after photograph. Yeah. Uh, and if it weren't for that old spot in, in, uh, in Sucker Town, I don't know if you could have found, I don't think I, an outsider could even find it. No, it took me a while to figure out where Sucker Town was. And, you know, people, everyone I talked to had a different idea of where, the, where, that, uh, where that settlement was. And Bob G's been such a good friend. Yeah. And yet Calvin says you hope to do a pic, uh, show with, uh, yeah. with Bob Cheeseman sometime Sucker on Sucker Town. Town. Shortly. <laughs> yeah, the sooner the better, huh? All so, right. So, yeah. Here we go. So this is the uh, the essay that I, I I always write an essay, and it takes uh, this is like a 15 page essay, and it's more words, and I always throw in pictures, uh, and maps, and you know stuff to describe what I'm talking about. But it's basically it's a this tells a the story. Of, it's a, it tells a story. It's a it's more or less a small book. Um, it is. It really and, is. Uh, but I I try to take all this material. And some of that material will find its way into the descriptions for the photographs, but this is like the you know the source material. But um, we'll we'll go over each section here you know briefly. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Hi. So we're we're uh, near, nearing the end of our discussion about this wonderful calendar, and we're talking about this the essay that you spent. Yeah. The essay so is obviously the, the hardest part about this. Oh, of course uh, it is. About the calendar because the information that I find for the essay is then transferred to the descriptions in the uh, in the in the monthly description. So I have to come up with information here, and then what I can't fit here goes into the uh, into the, into the descriptions. You know, the whole calendar process takes about four months to do. I started this calendar around July third, oh, and boy. and finished it. You know, just a week, about a week ago. You know, in terms of the layout, so it's you know it's a lot of work. But uh, so what I in this calendar here, I, I talk about the establishment of the early roads and bridges in the, in the town, and we'll just go through each section briefly here. Um, it's very difficult to figure out, obviously, what roads existed in the early days, and you know you have to assume that the roads today that we were on probably were in existence, you know, uh, 200 years ago. But what we find is that a lot of these roads have been modified heavily, cha the routes changed, but the general paths are about the same. But, you know, you look at all the roads today and you can't really say that this road here was built in 1797 and then this road was built 1811 or something like that. But fortunately there is information out there that you can you know, pin it down to. So, one of the first maps I've ever seen of the village of Champlain was uh, um, taken, was made by Pliny Moore in, in, in November of 1788 when he came up here in a boat to build a sawmill at Perry's Mills. And he needed the sawmill to, uh, to make boards so you could build frame houses. And that was the very first thing he did. So I wrote about that in, I don't know, two seven, 2007 or eight, where he came up and, and he kept a diary, which is really good. So on the back of a receipt, he drew the footpaths from the different settlements, from the, the sawmill to the three or four people that came up, they built their log, log houses in town. And that was uh, um, Samuel Ashman, uh, L. Nathan Rogers, William Beaumont, and plenty more. So I was able to figure out that these footpaths, which were little dots uh, in the map, was actually part of Oak Street, the beginning of Oak Street, uh, right down to the bridge here, where there was no bridge then. And then uh, Route 9 going down to Rock Hill Farm, which was uh, just south of Route 11, and that's where El Nathan Rogers Farm was. So that was actually the first, the first paths in town became the roads uh, that we know of today. And we know that some of the paths created by Native Americans before white settlers came through here have turned into roads over. Yeah, and then we'll probably get to that in, you know, when we get to Rouse's Point because obviously the, the road that goes from the border along the lake shore 
down, you know, uh, down to even uh, then along the Lake Shore Road in uh, Coopersville, that was probably all, uh, you know, paths and trails going back hundreds of years um, that just be over time became established and then, you know, you're selling land and then building houses and when your first few houses are built, it's very hard to locate a, move, a road. For sure. So the next paragraph we have is uh, the road that never was, I called it. Um, 1856, it was proposed that a road be built from the Perry's Mills Road, um, which is in the western part of the village of Champlain, directly across to, uh, to Prospect Street, where St. Mary's Cemetery is. Ah. And uh, a few townspeople proposed that, and uh, it seemed to make a lot of sense because then you wouldn't have to go into the village over two bridges and up a hill. You could go straight through, uh, almost in a straight line, up to uh, Prospect Street and then up to the border. Uh, I don't know why it wasn't built. Um, you could speculate. Um, what I found out, we'll talk about it later, in 1816, when Benjamin Moores wanted to build a bridge at, at Coopersville, the people in the village of Champlain were opposed to it because people then wouldn't travel through the village to uh -huh. out of their way, you know, to because that was the village that had the only bridge in town. Yeah. So in 1816, yeah. you know, Benjamin Moores says, hey, there's people who are selfish because they want uh, townspeople to to travel 10 miles out of their way to take a bridge through the village of Champlain. Isn't that amazing? A story and, uh, that can be transposed to modern times yeah. uh, in, in arguments about many things. So, you know, it could be that people were opposed to that because it would have bypassed, you know, people going through the town and or through the village of Champlain where something? you had stores, etc. But, you know, it's only speculation. Uh, the next one was, paragraph is the incorporation of the village of Champlain and naming was street. So Champlain, if you look at the maps, many different maps of the village, uh, there's many different names and uh, street names. And it's, it's not consistent. It always changes. Um, Oak Street was called Canada Street. Um, it was called Moore Street in the early days. Uh, the Chestnut Street today, which is off Oak Street, was called Matilda Street and named after Plenty Moore's daughter. And before that, it was called Church Street. That's the street oh, just up the road that. here no, because can't. there was the, uh, the Presbyterian Church was yeah. built on it. And it was burned down by a Canadian in 1844. And, uh, and that's when they built the Session House and then the, uh, the, the old Village Hall after that, 1850. So um, there's a lot of different streets that have had different names. Uh, Main Street was always called Main Street, uh, but the upper part of Main Street on the west side was called Corbin Street um, because of uh, the people who lived up at the border where uh, the I-87 border is today. It was the, uh, the Corbins. Um, and, uh, you know, the Second Street, Third Street, Pine Street, all these had different names. Uh, Church Street today was called Mechanic Street uh, for unknown reasons uh, in an in a old map, 1843 map. So uh, there's many different names, but when the village was incorporated, um, there was a law that was passed, 1874, that basically said what these streets were, and it, it hasn't changed since. Okay. One of the earliest roads in town uh, was actually built uh, probably by Elias Dewey. And that was uh, the road to Dewey's Tavern from Rouse's Point. It's one of two roads that were the roads established from Rouse's Point from the lakeshore to the village of Champlain. Right. Dewey came 1797 and uh, bought, he bought land where his, uh, Dewey's Tavern is today where the, uh, the, uh, the, the high school is today, too, in that area. And uh, he more or less had to chop his way from Rouse's Point to his property, and, and then a road became established there. And that road was used heavily, you know, by the military, uh, you know, when they came over from Vermont, landed in Rouse's Point, and then marched to Dewey's Tavern, and, uh, you know, his, his house became a focal point. So then uh, there was a road 
may have been established before that time, 1797, or before going up to uh, Canada. And that's Route 276 today. And then you have Prospect Street, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, um, which was established 1808. Other roads were from Champlain, uh, was an 1808 road, which is known as the uh, uh, Champlain Street in Rouse's Point. That was laid out 1808 from Rouse's Point to, I think, Hayford Road. And then there was a lot of uh, squabbling in, in Rouse's Point about people saying it was too hard to build a road from that location there into the village of Champlain because it would have been too hard to maintain. Ah. And uh, uh, it was decided then to build the road. And that road, you know, basically later became Route 11. Uh, from Rouse's Point to Elm Street, and then when Route 11 was built, it bypassed the village of Champlain and uh, went around uh, the village. But you see in early maps of Elm Street, it shows Lakeshore Road, or, you know, Lake Street, I think I said, um, which is Elm Street. It says the road to Rouse's Point. So there's, you know, then the other road I had was 1788. That's the road going out to Paris Mills, et cetera. So um, another road, you know, that, again, we were talking about was Elm Street. Uh, further down in the Sesse, and Elm Street was laid out in the early maps of Pliny Moore, early, early drawings of Pliny Moore's house, you see more or less a dotted path. And uh, that dotted path later became a road, and, uh, you know, 1820 or so, uh, Pliny Moore was the road was basically became a highway, or which was more of a, a designation um, in town. It was probably widened and made, you know, into a better road. And that road was uh, went from the Pliny Moore House, which is right here, or Prospect Street, all the way to the Great Hollow. And what's funny is you read Pliny Moore's description to, of 1820, and nothing in his description survives today. You know, he says the farm of, of uh, Mr. Nathaniel Nichols. Well, that farm is where Sheridan Iron Works is. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. So you wouldn't know that, you know, because Sheridan is, yeah. you know, 1840s, 50s, you know, whatever, you know the, the, the original foundry. Uh, and certain roads continued, you know, from the rapids right up to Elm Street. Now they're, it's cut off by Route 11. And then he talks about the Great Hollow the bridge where the Great Hollow is. Well, today that's the small, uh, um, it's like a ditch, you know, that's <laughs> basically next to the So crib. much for the Great Hollow, yeah, right? the Great Hollow, it's a ditch basically where <laughs> the credit union is on Elm Street, yeah. past Sheridan, and I know people for years have been filling it in with, uh, you know, dirt and stuff. So, they and apparently in the 1830s and 40s there used to be uh, you know, uh, you know, stream going through there, big, you know, trees, religious camp meetings were held in that camp area. Meetings, yep, I yeah, about and those. it was a very, you know, beautiful area. Um, and um, um, he called it the Great Hollow. So anyway, um, the next road is, it took me some time to figure this out, is the roads in Coopersville. Uh, those roads have changed dramatically um, because the Route 9B um, was put in and it circumvented certain parts of the road to, and then you had the overpass where the railroad tracks are and all that changed, you know, recently, when, you know, whenever Route 9B was upgraded. But uh, it showed in the old days Route 9B uh, went connected to Hayford Road and Hayford Road went straight up to to Champlain. Yeah. And of course in 1869 it was everything was a dirt road back then. But they cut that they they discontinued it and one of the first roads they built was in 1796 that just went from the lake shore to the the mills in in uh, in uh, in Coopersville. But now that some part of that 1796 road is now Route 9B, and that road is extended up to Rouse's Point. So it's grown in stages. Um, on the other side, the Lakeshore Road going uh, along the lake on the other side, Coopersville Bridge, did not exist for many years. And uh, um, it was only after the bridge was built that 
the road probably was built. Um, the, as I said, Lakeshore Road, a Canadian settlement, was probably circa 1783. Um, and that's when the, uh, the, the Canadians who fought in the Revolutionary War settled. Um, the area around uh, the mouth of the Chazy River going down to Chazy, and then they were allocated land and uh, around 1785 or 86 and uh, maybe even 1787. So that road was probably established, you know, at that time, if not before, you know, if it, you know, it could have been an Indian um, path. Lake Street in Rouse's Point is also another very old road. It's probably one of the earliest roads in the whole town, and it probably existed, um, um, you know, when the first settlers came to town. Um, that could be Rouse and, and uh, you know, into Rouse's Point. But there was a small path from Rouse's Tavern, which is where Fort Montgomery was, uh, down to Ezra Thurber's house, and uh, which is where Meyer Street is today. And that was basically Rouse's Point, just maybe three or four buildings, you know, houses on the lakeshore. And, you know, Rouse's Point was always used as a uh, place to, you know, get on boats to, you know, as a landing port for sure. uh, people coming down from Canada or going over to Vermont. Um, another important road, if you flip the page here, um, shows the, uh, the State Road, Route 9, and that was, uh, um, has probably many different dates of being built, and, you know, what I found was you may have a footpath built one year, say 1788, then it turns into a small road another year, and then it's surveyed a little bit more, and then it's, you know, petition is made, and then it's converted into a highway, which was probably, you know, had a different designation. And, yeah. And that's what probably the state road was. So it's very hard to, you know, establish when a road was built because it was probably built in stages and improved in stages. Um, but I assume Route 9, State Road, was obviously, in, you know, is part of Plenty Moore's 1788 map down to El Nathan Rogers' house, Rock Hill Farm. And then I think sometime after that, 1797, they just pointed it straight down toward Plattsburgh and, and built it then, but it's, it's not easily known. Um, the next one is, uh, topic is the Great Northern Turnpike. Now, this is quite interesting because the Great Northern Turnpike was established by the state legislature in 1805 to build a particular turnpike from Albany to Canada. Pliny Moore was the president of the company, and then he had other Champlainers and you know, uh, you know, on this commission, people from Plattsburgh, uh, uh, Essex County, and and there was a large number of commissioners, and they all contributed money, bought shares, and then they had other people buy shares too, you know, and uh, they. Uh, the, the idea was to raise money to build a road. And, uh, of course, it was, this is 1805, 1806, so it's quite a bit different today. You don't have earth movers and, you know, dynamite, yeah. and, you, know, a, you know, it takes hundreds and hundreds of men, and you're basically going through the Adirondacks. So what I did was I tried to figure out where the Great Northern Turnpike was because, you know, a lot of it's, present today. You know, the roads are still present today. The Great Northern Turnpike in Champlain, oddly enough, is Prospect Street. And today we look at it as just being another street, you know, where there's houses on it. But in those days, there weren't any houses on it. It was a road that was laid out in 1807 uh, from the border, and it was to connect uh, to the K Great King's Roadway or highway, you know, that went right up through Idletown to the border. And that was like 1797. So they laid out Prospect Street to Route 276, and that became part of the turnpike. The road then went south and uh, went through uh, went through Plattsburgh and over a Sable Chasm, you know, south, through the Adirondacks, uh, uh, Scro uh, Scroon River area, um, all the way to uh, uh, Kingsbury, New York. And it was 
1806, they surveyed it, you know, it was, you know, spent a number of months surveying the land and uh, getting the rights to, to build a road. And then 1807, the first half, the, uh, uh, the road was bid out to, you know, and people would bid, contractors would bid for three miles or 20 miles. And in those days, it was about $1,000 a mile um, <laughs> to, to, uh, funny to, to build a road, yeah. $2,000 a mile if it was in a mountainous area. Problem was, these guys got their got got in over their heads, and uh, you know there was a war scare. They thought we were going to go to war, and there was an embargo. Money started drying up, so I don't think they ever finished the whole turnpike. Um, I actually followed the turnpike, and actually, what what I read is that the state at some point took over the building of this turnpike you know, based on the original surveys, that's mostly Route 9 today and going in part of Route 22, but definitely Route 9 going through the Adirondacks. So, you know, these people here, 1805, plenty more, you know, no one really knows it now, but, you know, these roads like that we know of Route 9, the old Route 9 going to uh, um, Kingsbury is, uh, was built by, you know, partially built by a Champlainer, you know, or at least organized. Um, and that's uh, and that's the uh, you know the uh, the history of the Great Northern Turnpike. The uh, we'll flip the pages a little bit more. Talk about the bridges. Um, so much information and so little time. We have just a few minutes left, yeah. but we want to talk about bridges. Yeah. The other ha the other part of the topic we've already talked most about is the the, the establishment of the bridges in the town. And the first bridge built in, in Champlain was built here, actually, uh, in front of Plenty Moore's house. And, uh, you know, and there's a map of 1789 showing his house with no bridge. 1793, he wrote a letter to a state commissioner of highways asking that money be allocated to build a bridge. And that bridge was built, that was basically the Elm Street Bridge. And uh, that was probably built 1794, a wooden bridge. And uh, and then the second bridge built was the upper bridge, uh, which was uh, built uh, at Main Street, and that was more of a stick bridge. It wasn't really a main bridge, but it was a bridge to get across the river to plenty more stone uh, stone mill. You know, so people would take their grain and right here in front of this uh, bank building, they would offload it at the River Street here because it's a gentle slope take it across this bridge, walk through Main Street, walk over the other bridge, and, and get their grain milled, you know, over there. And that bridge has had many different uh, views of it, um, you know, and uh, we talked about that and the controversy that Plenty Moore had about putting a highway there. Um, and that was the upper bridge. The uh, Dubois Road Bridge is also a very old bridge, and it was one of the first... Uh, Iron Bridge built there was 1871. The uh, the uh, Coopersville Bridge is uh, another very important bridge, and we mentioned that before. And Benjamin Moore's purchased land here in 1805 and built uh, um, uh, several mills here. In 1816, he asked the state legislature for money to build a bridge here to avoid the 10 miles of travel to the village of Champlain, and as I said, the, the merchants were opposed to that because they wanted people to march 10 miles out of their way and go to their, you know, versus going over the bridge. Anyway, he prevailed. The bridge was built, but it probably wasn't built until the 1820s. And then there's many, many different versions of it, and, you know, later years there was a drawbridge, so that could let canal boats pass. And, uh, Unfortunately, all these bridges have been, um, um, have come and gone, and, uh, you know, there's been uh, um, many, many different bridges built, and, uh, and, and many of these bridges have been destroyed, and it's not up until the 1930s that these bridges that we see here have actually remained standing and have survived all the ice storm. It's you know, amazing. Da ice. David... If people watching this, and people watching this always have, they comment, the comments have been favorable over the years. If they've got information, 
little tidbits to add, how would they get in touch with you? Um, well, you can always uh, get, send me an email, DASP, DASP at hotmail.com, or you know, contact uh, Celine Paquette, or if you want calendars, uh, you can uh, um, go to the Town and Village offices, Kenny Drugs, uh, Shamblin Memorial Library, uh, Cornerstone Gift, and uh, in Plattsburgh too, you know, at CCHA and uh, Cornerstone Bookstore and Conroy's. So, is there any web? Is there any website where information can be found? Yeah, I, I do have a website that I've been doing is uh, uh, MorrisfieldPress.com. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Bill Morrisfield. Huh? Bill Morrisfield. M O O R S F I E L D. There. Okay. Press.com. <laughs> There's so many spellings for so many things, and I bet there is not one bridge that you didn't cover. Yeah, I think I covered all the bridges in 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 the town of Champlain. So. So if anybody has comments or questions, contact you. Stop in here, please. Our special thanks to Celine Paquette for letting us use this wonderful history center, the Old Bank Building yep. in, in Champlain. Uh, a, a tip of the Gordy Little Hat, hometown cable, our little corner hat to you, David. Thank you. For your intense work and your great passion to uncover these things. If it hadn't been for your family history, I don't know if you've done it, but I think I, I know this passion was built into your genes. You, from, you from gotta childhood. wonder. You gotta wonder that, but it's, I think it's true. It's, I definitely like learning. I think things. the ghosts of your ancestors are yeah. with you today and probably yeah. help you. And, and they're right up the road too. Yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> people, if you know, I tell people go. I love to walk through cemeteries. I know you do too, yeah. and I know most people interested in history love cemeteries just to check out some of these names and confirm what David says is absolutely true. Yeah. Thanks to you, David. Thanks to Calvin for carrying the camera low these many years. Thanks to all of our viewers. And thanks to you who write out a generous check to Calvin Castine and care of Hometown Cable on the Ridge Road in Champlain. Who knows where we're going to be next time for our...